to the Motherhood Unstressed Podcast, and I'm your host, Liz Carlisle. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for being here. Thank you for pressing play. And honestly, I'm not that surprised that you've pressed play on this particular episode because I'm speaking with the amazing Catherine May. Her new book, Wintering, The Power of Rest and Retreat in Difficult Times, is out now. It's a brilliant nonfiction book, rich with nature writing, poetry, mythology, philosophy, and memoir. And it all elegantly explores ways that the natural world tries to teach us over and over to take a season of deep rest and retreat. Even Elizabeth Gilbert, you remember her from Eat, Pray, Love, loved the book saying it's every bit as beautiful and healing as the season itself. It's a truly beautiful book. And that's how I felt when I was reading it. I'm just so thrilled. I felt so lucky to have her on the show. And I just am so excited to share her words with you today. So if you love it, please share it with a friend who needs to hear it and enjoy my conversation with the amazing Catherine May. Well, hello, Catherine. Welcome to the show. I am so glad that you're here. Hi, thanks for having me. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, the book itself is amazing. I, like I was saying before, I feel so lucky to have you on the show <laughs> to share your wisdom with my audience. You know, why was this book so important for you to put out into the world? Was it just a cathartic process of healing for yourself or did you actually intend for it to be a balm for others? Yeah, I think it was really that I was, I wanted to give something to other people. So I I just kind of reached a point in my life when I realized I had a kind of expertise in wintering, as I call it, which is these times of life where you fall through the cracks uh, and feel like life is carrying on without you, I suppose. And I just, you know, sometimes you have these moments of clarity when you join the dots between for me, all the moments that I'd wintered, but also all the moments that my friends were and were wintering at the time and had wintered in the past. And yeah, I suppose I thought we don't talk about this. We don't have a modality for getting through it. We don't acknowledge it as normal. We actually, in fact, do the opposite. We make every single person going through every single crisis feel like they've uniquely failed. And I just wanted to create something that that gave that language and that perspective, I suppose. Yeah. Well, and it does exactly that, you know, through your own personal story, your journey. Um, I just, why do you think, you know, going back to what you just said, why do you think it's so shameful, this process of wintering, this process where you feel just completely out of sorts, like you have failed in some way? Mm. Why are we ashamed and why is it on us in that way? We just don't have a narrative about that, really, not not in, cu- in current society. I mean, I think actually we used to have more of a way of talking about it. I mean, when you look at our folklore, when you look at our religious stories, we, we probably talked about that much more cyclical way of living in great depth, actually. But the 20th century, we've changed a lot, haven't we? We've started thinking about success in very straightforward terms and about this idea of lives that go from zero to a hundred in this kind of perfect upward slope and we've lost this really delicate important dialogue about the times when everything's failing and you know we think that we've pushed a load of things back you know we think that we've pushed illness back we think that we've pushed death back Um, We think that we can read the right book to make sure that we get through every life phase perfectly. It's great to talk about this on a, a, you know, blog blog with motherhood blog, sorry, podcast with motherhood in the title, because actually I, I felt that very strongly when I first became a mother, that there was like supposed to be a method for me to get this right. And I couldn't get it right. And actually, the failing is the important bit, I think. Mm. That's where we find our humanity. That's where we find our compassion. And it's where we find our way through, our personal way through. I think that's vital, actually. Yeah, and I just got chills when you were saying that because it is like in those slowed down moments where we almost can't breathe sometimes that Mm. it's like you get these insights that you never would have gotten if Mm. everything was going so well and so perfectly. it's, It's almost like shock therapy, But I love the way that you have framed it in that it's actually, it's the best medicine that we can have in that moment. And the the part about motherhood is just so spot on. I think for me, like that's when I really came to know myself and came to question everything that I previously thought about myself before Mm. when, you know, up late at night with this baby 
thinking I'm (laughs) doing it wrong and failing and you're just in this totally different realm. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, for me, I think motherhood was the first time I came across a challenge that I couldn't get on top of, but I also couldn't duck out of. And that is like a, that's a moment, isn't it? That moment when you think, oh, whoa, I've got to see this through, even when it's awful. (laughs) And this episode is sponsored by Masa. Masa is a fitness company based out of Atlanta, Georgia. They have hundreds of on-demand workouts and recoveries for everyone, new movers and athletes alike, 300 and growing. Podcast listeners can get 30 days free on top of a 14-day trial with the coupon code MOTHERHOODUNSTRESSED30. Now, after 44 days, a subscription of just $9.99 per month is available to you. Now, remember, these are workouts that fit every schedule. Whether you have 10, 30, or 60 minutes, you're going to be able to get it in in a creative way. And they're actually enjoyable, driven by music and amazing coaching. So if you are someone who has been looking for an extra push, an extra hand to help you up, this is where you want to go. So be sure to download the Masa app on your smartphone and use my code MOTHERHOODUNSTRESS30 to save. Nobody says to you, like, nobody says your baby's going to wake in the night. Whatever the hell you do, your baby is going to wake in the night. There is no method that's going to stop that from happening. You know, your baby's going to go on crying jags that you can't solve sometimes. Like, all of that stuff we have just lost the ability to say there are bits of this that suck very badly and that's part of the job that's part of the mother work that we do and you will look back on it one day and laugh a little bit but also maybe (laughs) look yeah still not there still not ready (laughs) you're still too fresh (laughs) well I mean I you know I only had the one because I just couldn't ever face it again (laughs) right right no I get it but actually, I'm so careful about the way I talk to other women about motherhood now as well, to, to open up that space for them, particularly when they've got tiny babies, to say, oh, this is horrible at the moment. And, and it's like we've lost the subtlety of thought to be able to love someone intensely and want to do absolutely the right thing for them and to be hating it at the same time. Like, we can hold both of those things. We, we're big enough for that. We can do that. We need to trust women more. Yes. And to understand that that's not a bad thing. It's okay to be like, this is not okay. And I'm not okay in this yeah. moment. Like, that's okay. I love that you just said that. Like, it makes me think of this one other line from the book. I had to write it down because I loved it so much. It said, the problem with everything is often it looks a lot like nothing. You know, you're talking about the busyness that we're all experiencing. You know, what did you learn about slowing down, about centering you know in the midst of of everyone else just being busy and what can we get from that yeah well I spent years in a huge rush really just trying to get everything done and to be everything you know I wanted I wanted to be seen as important in my job I wanted to be seen as competent at the very least but I wanted to be more than competent and I wanted to get great satisfaction from that I obviously also wanted to have a great home life. There were so many things that I was trying to do and I was throwing myself at the world (laughs) endlessly. And actually, I got to the point where I had to stop. You know, like stopping for me was not a choice. My health just collapsed underneath me, mental and physical, both at the same time. And by the time I got to the doctor and they, you know, because like I had these big kind of gut health problems, they said that I had the gut of a 75-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> I was 40. Um, and that was a wake-up call. You know, that was the work of stress in my mm-hmm. life. And when I looked back over that time when I'd been so busy and striving so hard to be everything, it was just a blur. It was just this one big sense of panic and rush and no pleasure and slowing down for me you know did not come easy it did not come willingly Um, but actually I would never go back to that life now I just relish my time and space to think to be to breathe and to be well I I just you know what am I if I'm not well what do I have if I don't have my health that's something that's really worth fighting for and I I mean a few years on you know this was not my immediate thought but now I really strongly feel 
that we all need to start imagining lives that allow us to be well and happy and calm like calm is possible you know we are allowed to feel calm and content that won't stop all those other crises coming but we we can imagine our working lives it is possible to do this in another way and I you know I had to be taught that very forcibly but I would not ever go back to working full-time which of course is many more hours than full-time um in a you know in a high stress job it's not worth the trade-off for the years that you lose to it Why do you think we put ourselves in these positions? Is it ego? Is it our parents? Is it society at large? Why do we feel like we have to do it, especially as women, you know, Mm. and have it all and and have the perfect home and the life and then have, you know, be killing it at work and just get all the accolades? Because, I mean, we have the ability to do it, right? Like Mm. we have the ability to be super overachievers, but why do we feel like we have to? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I I think it's different for everybody, maybe. For me, it actually hit, hit home after I became a mother, in fact. I mean, before I had my son, I worked in quite a laid-back way. I was always a freelance. I always did the work I wanted to do. I always took time off for creative work. And it was only after my son came along that I felt this sense of urgency to... I think I'd felt so kind of pushed out of the world when he was tiny that I had to kind of elbow my way back in again. Mm. This episode is sponsored by Mommy Makeup. There's a saying, necessity is the mother of invention. Well, it's also the mother of Mommy Makeup. After being a professional makeup artist for over 20 years, Deborah Rubin Roberts had the privilege to work with some of the best brands and talent in the beauty industry. But it was when she became a mom that everything changed, and she developed her own makeup line, Mommy Makeup, clean beauty for busy women. She figured that if she needed cosmetics that were fast and easy to use and gave makeup artists quality results, surely other women did too. And she was right. Everything in Mommy Makeup is talc-free, paraben-free, cruelty-free, non-comedogenic, which just means it won't clog your pores multitasking and made in the United States. Now I love the triple stick. I use it on my lips, my cheeks, and my eyes, and it just knocks out so much time when I'm trying to rush out the door um, and get to work and still look beautiful and presentable. And one thing that I love about her products is that they really do last all day. So if I'm on set all day, I know I can rely on the lipstick. It's going to stay there um, and look great the whole entire day. So if you are interested in checking them out for yourself, be sure to take advantage of their free color consultation service and you get 10 bucks off when you do that. It's just someone walking you through and helping you pick the best colors for you based on a picture of you with no makeup on. And it really does help. It really makes the process that much better. Um, It's a win-win for the company and for you. Um, And be sure if you do see anything that you love, use my code unstressed to save. And you can just head over to mommymakeup.com to learn more. I felt like I'd lost ground. I felt very worried about money. I felt like I needed to guarantee him a better life. I needed, and in fact, the job that, that very nearly finished me off, I went into saying like, I need financial security. I've mm. got to have a pension. I need savings. I need to make sure I can pay off a mortgage at some point. And it, it was almost, it was almost part of my nesting instinct in a strange kind of way. Like I wanted to provide and make everything safe and I know that sounds counterintuitive given what I've just said about the effect it had on me, but it, it's like a kind of thwarted instinct to sort yeah. everything out, isn't it? And to to look after everybody. But also, yeah, I didn't I didn't want to lose my footing in the world. I think I felt so isolated in those early days with a tiny child at home that I kind of wanted to force my way back into the world of people talking about interesting things and doing stuff and achieving stuff yeah yeah to feel connected to who you were before maybe actually to I think I was trying to be better than I was before I think I look back on those times and thought I'd maybe wasted years of you know and now I look back and think no I had it right at that point it was only afterwards but it was a kind of panic yeah it really was it was a fear that I wasn't enough and that I'd Mm. never be enough again and that was it for me like I couldn't I was just going to go to waste somehow you just saying that I think took off a weight of so many women listeners to this right now because 
all of us have had that feeling. All of mm-hmm. us, you know, especially with the first one that you bring home, like you don't know what's going on, who you yeah. are even anymore, yes. what you want. And then, yes, of course, you want to do the best you can for these children, mm. whatever that means. You know, you're just going to plow through. And how long was it before, you know, you noticed that you needed to to change the way that you were going? How many years had it been? Oh man, I mean, six years, maybe five or six years. It was a long time. It was really, I I just, every time I felt that stuff was going wrong, I accelerated rather than decelerated. Mm. And I think, you know, I looked around me and I felt like other women were so content with less, you know, I met so many mothers who said, oh, I'm so relieved to be out of work now that I don't have to go back. And I mean, we could never have afforded for me not to work anyway. That was not an option in our family. But I wanted the opposite of that. I wanted to go back and and to feel worthy and to feel like I was something because I didn't feel like I was ever going to be mother of the year. I thought I could be a good enough mother um, and maybe I could be a really good professional at the same time. But yeah, it took me a long time to really be able to come to terms with not being able to do that actually in tr- in complete truth and that's hard because some people can some people seem very content doing that and very able to do it uh, but yeah that's uh that's life isn't it sometimes knowing that you're not the top of that pile yeah but I think you know do they really think that they're doing it all you know even the people who seem like they have it all together when you really peel back the layers I mean maybe there's just zero self-awareness going on maybe they are just plowing through day in and day out or maybe I don't know it's hard to say until you really you know peer behind the veil Mm. um but I think when you look at people that really cope they have a lot of help actually as well and I like I that's great I couldn't afford the level of help that I'd have needed to cope but you know I have a very good friend who's very successful and she has like a mother's aide who comes in in the morning. It's actually called a mother's aide, which seems quite dated now. I don't know what that means, but <laughs> like the men in the household, but um, who comes in and like sorts the house out for a couple of hours every morning. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, all of those things I think can mean that you can cope, but I was not in that financial position by any means. And so, you know, you're doing all the housework at the weekend as well. It's it's just exhausting. We were not ever made to do 24 hours a day working and yeah. to, to be scheduling our lives in the way that we schedule them. I was reading some interesting um, research about, um, you know, very ancient families, like way back in our ancestral past. And you know, we tend to think of those people as having to constantly work to keep food on the table. But actually, they rested for most of the day, they spent a lot of their time at leisure, just hanging out, just drifting around, like the the hunting and the gathering took up very small amounts of time in their day. And they didn't work past what they needed. So they would have enough to eat, and then they'd have a rest and hang out and, and, and you know, enjoy themselves. Yeah. And I think we think that we're made to do the opposite. And I'm not sure that's true. I think we lose such a lot when we don't rest and we don't like kick back and laugh actually. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm. Yes. And let our spirits just kind of intertwine with each other's. And Mm. that's part of what I really loved about the book too, is your mentioning of the animals and the ancient culture, Mm. you know, the people of Finland who know how to winter well. Can you talk to us about, you know, those cultures and those, those elements that you brought into the book and why that was important to you? Yeah. So when I was researching the book, I wanted to look at cultures that were intimate with proper hard winters I mean where I live in the UK we occasionally get a bit of snow and that's about as bad as it gets but I feel like the people who are used to getting cut off every winter who live in the far north know something about how to survive personal winters as well so I spoke to people from Norway Finland Sweden Iceland and just asked them how they think about it and what they all said was that they prepare very carefully. They always have winter in mind. So even in midsummer, they're busy stocking up food, um, filling their freezers with lovely things to eat. Um, you know, like if someone drops around your house in winter in Finland, you must give them some cake because they <laughs> come a long way in the cold. <laughs> I love that. I thought that was very hospitable. Mm-hmm. But 
what uh, I think what's really important because we talk a lot about Scandinavia and how they love coziness and all of that kind of thing but they actually hate the snow they do not enjoy the snow they know that it's awful they all have stories of like friends they've lost who've gone out in a cold night and died I mean Mm. or, or who've had terrible car accidents or people who've become incredibly depressed over the winter And so all of that beautiful culture of hygge and making the house beautiful and filling everything with candles and like getting together as a family, that's not coming necessarily from a place of optimism. It's coming from a place of survival and knowing that to stay happy and to stay afloat, you absolutely must do all you can to make life nice. Like you you feather your bed because the outside is cold, not because everything's perfect. And it it comes from almost quite quite like a a pessimistic place. You know, we must keep working towards our happiness because sadness is always so very close. And I think that that has huge insight for us, that we are allowed to keep cheering ourselves up, actually, to keep deliberately making ourselves feel comfortable, cosy, coddled, looked after, cared for. We're allowed to take care really. This episode is sponsored by Pakli. Pakli means joy in Nahuatl, the language of the Aztecs. It's one of the ancient cultures that revered amaranth. Their founder, Sina Kriti, grew up in Mexico eating alegrías, which also means joy, a snack dating to the 16th century made from puffed amaranth and honey or chocolate. Pakli is her version of the ancient Mexican alegrías. Pakli has puffed amaranth, quinoa, and millet, highly nutritious ancient grains that are also considered superfoods. They mix those grains with high-quality organic ingredients, including chocolates, whole dried fruits, and nuts. There's never any additives, and it's always preservative-free. I love snacking on Pakli with my coffee, but my kids also love it in their lunches or as their morning snack. They always ask for it, and my son Nash loves the dark chocolate, which is uh, vegan. So Pakli is geared towards the adventurer food lover that appreciates other cultures and is inquisitive. It brings joy in every bite and will keep you coming for more. And that's something that you don't have to feel guilty about. You're going to be, you know, soothing that sugar, sugary sweet tooth, but you're doing it with foods that are packed with nutrition. So if you would like to try out Pakli for yourself, head on over to packlyfoods.com. That's P-A-K-T-L-I foods.com and be sure to use my code motherhood15 to save 15%. And I like the thing that interested me most was the culture of the sauna or the sauna. You have to call it the sauna if you're going <laughs> to you're going to go sound scandy. Um and now I hate saunas. I yeah. um oh, I'm not good in the heat at all. I'm a true cold lover. Um <laughs> I I took a sauna when I was researching the book and fainted cold out on the floor, which I wrote about in the book. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I like I think if you're more accustomed to it, maybe you're better at, at surviving in it. But um, they talk about how the sauna is not just like you know like a health club thing like we see it that might give your face a nice glow or whatever um but actually it's a it's a space where families sit together in peace and talk and listen and it brings about this very kind of calm state of mind it, it's, it kind of invites contemplation relaxation this sense of almost dreaminess um and I and that's vital to their culture that feels like a vital part of their existence because it's makes a part of the day special that would otherwise yeah. feel very dead in the middle of winter and I think that's really beautiful like you don't have to install a sauna to do that necessarily but I think we can make those very deliberate conscious spaces that are about creating happiness um and and coziness and warmth without installing the full charcoal burner (laughs) although that is tempting I know. Well, especially too, as we get into real deal winter here, Mm. at least in the States. I mean, I'm in Atlanta, so it's not serious. Just like you in the UK, (laughs) it's a little chilly, but that's it. Yeah. Um, But, you know, as you, I was thinking when you were saying like coddling ourselves, comforting ourselves, even if, you know, you're a woman listening to this right now, you don't have a family, but we still need that. You know, we Mm. still need that check-in. And that was something that I really got from the book was these themes of, of self-awareness 
and of, of contemplation kept coming up again and again. And it's like Mm -hmm. people who don't do that, who don't take the time to really see what's going on inside. It's like, the, the message hits you, it whispers, and then it knocks you, and then it really gets you. So Yeah, yeah. If you can tune into it early, then you can save yourself quite a lot of pain, I think. Um, I think most of us wait until any situation becomes urgent before we attend to it. Yeah. And by then, we've often been knocked off our feet already, and then it takes a long time to get back up again. Whereas actually, if we can learn to tune in and to be aware of what's happening for us you know on a very basic level how we're feeling physically and mentally what situations are are boiling in the background that maybe we don't want to pay attention to then actually we can deal with them we can learn to be ready for them it doesn't stop stuff coming from left field like you know a pandemic for example right but it does mean that we know where we are when all of that comes. And I think we spend a lot of time not necessarily being, as you say, very self-aware. And even if we are, we don't think that we should really deal with it because it seems indulgent. And it's mm. not indulgent in any way. It's not heroic to go marching on when you're suffering. Yeah. Where do you draw the line though? Because I do, I so agree with you about that. You know, Mm. we do need to stop and slow down, but also there's this, this other push to continue to be strong, to weather the winter, you know, to make Mm. it as, as, because we're going to go through it no matter what, you know, how do you, how do you draw the line even personally for yourself between relaxing into it, fully Mm. embodying it and okay, I'm going to pull myself up. I'm going to get through this. Yeah. I mean, there's always stuff that you have to do, you know, and I think actually we ask the wrong questions in a way because we assume that if we start to look after ourselves, we'll stop taking action and we'll stop doing the right thing. And actually, you know, doing the stuff that has to be done is what we do. It's hard to stop doing that. It's hard to actually hold back on doing more than we need to do. You know, like quite often we're looking after our families, but we're also trying to save the family next door as well and make sure that somebody else has got dinner or, you know, checking in on a friend that hasn't spoken to us for 20 years, but we're really worried about them. So actually, I think the opposite's true, like with the where do you draw the line, which is where are you going to draw the line between all of that helping and that massive effort of salvation that we seem to be constantly indulging in and saying instead, I'm going to take 20 minutes, you know, and it doesn't have to be a lot. I mean, I, you know, we've had a tough time this autumn in my family, like everyone's been very, very stressed. There's lots of, you know, been lots of people struggling who I've needed to personally look after and that is my responsibility no doubt but within that I've made sure that I just take some time and for me that's going out for a swim that's making time to read a book for a while it's actually you know sitting looking at a film on my laptop for an hour if I can get away with it or it might be going to bed early to make sure I've had enough sleep Mm. like you know that the other stuff can wait like my house does not have to be full of homemade Christmas decorations this Christmas it is okay for me to buy a cake from the store rather than bake it myself it's okay for me not to paint my toenails all winter while they're in heavy socks anywhere nobody's (laughs) gonna see them like all of that does not have to happen like that's in service to the outside world and what they think of me what I need sometimes is a hot bath on my own for for half an hour with nobody bothering me. And when I've had that hot bath, I come out a better person. Mm -hmm. I can do the stuff that I need to do, but also I get perspective about how much I'm often running myself into the ground doing stuff that nobody actually needs me to do, but that I do out of guilt and stress and, and overwhelm in the first place. I love it. I love it. Just reading your work, like it always seems like you've had this this wider sense of perspective and self awareness. I mean, you talk about you know when you were seventeen, going through you know your mm. first winter or a significant one. Do you mm. think it's because you've always been extra sensitive to to life to yourself that you've able to, you've been able to really express it through your writing and through your work? Yeah, I mean, my mental health was quite poor when I was a teenager. And after I had my really big breakdown when I was 17, you know, when I just couldn't function for six months, um, I think there was a, I remember hitting rock bottom within that. There was definitely a moment where I thought, 
actually, I don't think I can go any lower. And, oh, I'm still here. And, okay, so what do I, what are the steps? What are the steps up? And it was a really deliberate, conscious thought. And ever since then, I've been thinking very hard about how to make life work, just work, like not like how to make life perfect, not how to be a trillionaire and have a private jet. Like that's never been my concern. My concern has been, how do I survive this better? How do I learn to to be happy and to be on an even keel? And if you're a person that has to ask those questions, like you'll know how important they are. Not everybody has to ask those questions, but I did. And it took me a long time to get that right still. Like I still had other dips, you know, it wasn't like I sat there and figured it all out, but by my, you know, advanced years now, 43 of them, um, I am, I've got the hang of it more, you know, I, it's really true. I've got the hang of it. I am not the, I'm not as vulnerable to those dips because I have really studied how to how to cope the best I can I mean big things to me are like meditation getting into nature walking they are they're like my three things that I need to make sure that I'm okay you know um and I yeah that's about making all of it's about making space all of it Mm. absolutely so do you do you have like a list okay I have to do these things today <laughs> first thing in the morning because I do like I, I yeah. and now I call it my battle list like do this 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 and I know <laughs> I'm gonna be you know I'm gonna be good for the day or at least oh, that's really interesting yeah I think I'm I'm actually more um instinctive about it than that like I I'm always looking for little moments to drop out like that, that feels like my rebellion I think um <laughs> but I I know that feeling when I need it. So I, I mean, I walk every day. So maybe that's part of my battle list. I, I got a dog last year because, and one of the reasons was that I never wanted to, again, have my walk bumped. Like if I've got a dog, mm. I have to walk every day. No one can take my have walk to away. Do it. Yeah. Cause, Cause the truth is they'll feel much more sorry for the dog than they'd feel for me. I needed the walk too. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there we go. The dog needs her walk. Right. Um, mm. And I like, on top of that, I check in with myself. I find ways to check in. Um, and you can only do that if you fall silent for a while. I think we're often making so much noise all the time that we don't make that moment. And it, it only has to be short where you listen to the inside of your head and find out what you're feeling and how tired you are or how overexcited you are. Like overexcitement is just as bad as tiredness, I think, sometimes. Mm. when you're with other people and you know obviously as a very sensitive person empathetic person you know it's easy for us to pick up on other people's energies are you able Mm. to decipher what's your energy versus what's theirs and kind of cleanse that out so that you're really just coming from an authentic place uh that's hard for me because I'm autistic um I like autistic women are, are very commonly are very absorbent of other people's feelings so we like we find it hard not to not only kind of absorb how people are like people's level of energy but also to mimic that back like that's Mm -hmm. something that's how we relate and so I have to be very bounded actually about how I spend time with like some you know some people are more stressy than others I think it's probably fair to say yeah um and I I do have to be really careful like I've you know I've cut some people out of my life who would overwhelm me to the extent that I would develop a headache after an hour Mm -hmm. of time with them um I've had to walk away from those people but also like even in my working life because I work freelance um I will often cut out contracts that are with people who think every email is urgent Mm -hmm. and um are always asking for stuff to be done at last minute like that's how they work I can't I, can, I mean, I can work like that, but I don't want to work like that. And so actually I'm, I'm very, very careful about it. And, you know, like on a momentary basis as well, when I'm with people who are having a momentary dip, I will just do my best to notice what mm. their stuff is that they're bringing into the room. Because I think the problem comes when you don't really notice and you, you've absorbed yeah. it before you can think to say no no I'm here and they're there and that's okay <laughs> yeah um so it's it's more about being mindful I think but I, I am conscious about how much time I spend with other people as well because I I get very exhausted if I spend a lot of time 
with others, whoever they are and whatever their their levels are. So I've yeah, solitude is is really important for me actually. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, probably why walking is such like a beautiful thing for you too, mm. you know, because you're you're still with others, you're out in nature, you're getting the sun, but you're you are alone essentially with your thoughts, with your body, with yeah. your movement, with your breath. I don't really like to walk with other people actually, I have to say. I don't either. I don't either. <laughs> people, when people find out I walk quite, you know, they quite often say, will you walk with me? Like, um, oh, probably not. No. <laughs> I don't so want to talk. <laughs> right. I need to process. I want to talk to myself. So my pre, my last book was about um, was about me discovering I was autistic in my late thirties, and I um, it happened while I was walking the southwest coast path, um, which is this incredibly beautiful rugged path in Devon and Cornwall and Dorset in England, um, and it's it's really wild, it's really difficult, it's really remote, like. If you get fed up halfway through a walk, you're going to have to walk five miles to get to the nearest village, whatever oh happens. Like, no one can come and rescue you. Um, and that, what I learned during that time, because I'd never walked to that extent before, but what I really learned was that there's this point after about three hours of hard walking when your brain just becomes this gloriously empty space. And you don't, you're not even really conscious <laughs> at that point I think it's probably like your blood glucose levels have dropped so low that you're not <laughs> you, you know you can't you haven't got the energy to think anymore that's but that's that's the place where huge revelations happen that kind of land on you and feel like there's there was nothing that came before them it feels like boom they've just you know dropped into your head and I want to make as much space for that as possible and walking does that for me but you have to be walking alone because if you're trying to entertain someone else next to you and be like interesting, mm -hmm. um, you're missing out on this absolute, I mean, space for all of the big things in life to arrive. Oh, mm. I love that. I love that. I need a long walk. I think that's what I'm saying, really. I, can I do think that was right the result of this conversation today. <laughs> I'm going to have a walk this weekend. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I'll be with your, you in spirit there. Yeah, um, that's good. Um, and that's all we need. <laughs> I know, right? Over there. <laughs> um, oh my gosh, I can't believe we're almost out of time. Um, I could talk to you for so long. But I know, were, it's such an interesting conversation. <laughs> I know. If there were anything that you would want to leave with the listener, you know, with the reader who's going to pick up this book um, mm. to take away the mother, uh, what would that be? Oh, do it your way. You know, I think that's taken me all my life to realize that Every time I sought advice on how I should do things, I ended up resenting it and it felt heavy on me. And that actually, whenever I do stuff my way, and sometimes that's found by trial and error, like it's okay to get that a bit wrong, that I've been much happier. And I, I really wish I'd learned that when I was younger, you know? I really wish I'd truly absorbed the message that I'm able and competent to figure stuff out for myself and that there's no one system that's right for everybody I don't I don't think we I don't think we learn that until we're older do we some yeah, people never do until we've passed out in the sauna <laughs> yeah yeah I learned that <laughs> but that but that comes when you stop trying to be a good girl I think yeah. as well yes yeah. yes I love that. Yeah, I love this conversation because if anything, you know, that I've gotten from the book and from you and just how you live your life is you did it this way. You did it the way that everyone wanted you to do it and you rocked it. You were amazing. <laughs> I didn't always rock it first time though, okay? <laughs> I know, but then you were like, you know what? This is not, not going to work for me. Like you are a true feminist in that way, fully oh, yeah. in yourself. Like I mm. just think that that's so admirable and I, I just love talking to women like you because of that. Yeah, and I, you know... I think there's loads of us out there that are ready to not be good girls and to, you know, not do as we're told and to, to make trouble. And I really, I love it when I see women making trouble in the world, like really good trouble. Yeah. I, you know, that's what we're doing here, I think. Yeah. And then we're more of ourselves, you know, we're, we're there for our work, for our children, for, for mm. life, you know, much more I, so than, than before. 
And like, what do we want to teach our children after all? Do we want them to go on the same track that loads of us followed and to have to have that revelation that we do later? I want my son to know that he can drop out of whatever the hell he wants to drop out of until he finds the right thing. Like, I'm never going to force him into a funny little mould that I just, that in my brain works. I, he needs to know that he can make mistakes that the big skill in life is learning that you've made the mistake and walking away rather than sticking with the mistake that feels so awkward. Yes, yes, Mm. yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you for those (laughs) words. Thank you for that lesson. Catherine, your book is wintering. It's out now. I I can't wait for the movie when that comes out because it needs to be one. <laughs> it's Ooh, just, who play me? <laughs> Ooh, I don't know. Let's think about that. Um, thank you so much for your work and your light and, and just everything that you're putting out into the world. Thank you. Thank you. It's been lovely talking to you on your lovely podcast. Um, likewise. <laughs> You've been listening to the Motherhood Unstressed podcast, and I'm your host, Liz Carlisle. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm so grateful that we got this time together today. And if you love this episode, I would so appreciate it if you would share it out on your social media. Make sure to tag us at Motherhood Unstressed. Connect with us at Motherhood Unstressed. I'd love to connect with you uh, and see where the work has gone in the world. And make sure that you subscribe so that you never miss out on an amazing interview with an incredible guest or our weekly guided meditations every Wednesday.